spring. It's just afternoon central time, which means it's my privilege to welcome you to today's alumni career webinar, Navigating the Academic Job Market, CV and Cover Letter Best Practices by our own A.J. Ehrenstein. My name is Dan Gould, and I'm the Senior Associate Director for Career and Affinity Programs here at the University of Chicago. As part of the Alumni Association, our office is committed to helping provide alumni with the resources they need to stay competitive in an ever-changing job market and support the alumni community with career resources, networking channels, and job search capabilities. I get the privilege today to introduce you to our presenter, UChicago alumnus A.J. Ehrenstein. A.J. is a 2010 graduate of the Master's Program in Humanities and is currently the Associate Director of Graduate Career Development and Employer Relations at UChicago Grad. In this capacity, he manages the four-member graduate career development team and works with cross-campus partners, such as the Alumni Association, to support the career goals of graduate students as well as postdocs. As a lecturer of the Humanities Division, he also teaches a master's level course on the value of humanistic inquiry in multiple contexts. He earned his bachelor's degree in political and social thought from the University of Virginia. For today's webinar, AJ is going to outline best practices for job documents for those on the academic job market with a focus on the CV and the cover letter. This presentation is going to help demystify the process of creating the most commonly requested documents for academic positions at diverse institutions. And AJ will also leave time to answer your questions at the end of today's presentation, or I will interject throughout the presentation to relay them to him. So without further ado, thank you, AJ, for joining us. We're happy to have you. Thanks, Dan. I'm excited to be here in uh, Harper. Uh, here on 53rd Street. Thanks to the Alumni Association for hosting us. Um, again, everybody, my name is AJ Ehrenstein. I'm the current Associate Director at UChicago Grad, which for those of you who are current students, you might be familiar with. For those of you who are recent alumni, you'll remember it as Graduate Student Affairs. Our shop provides uh, basically one-stop shopping for students and recent alumni when it comes to career development, uh, oral communication support, fellowship advising, and a host of other resources. We do things like run the Family Resource Center. Our partners at the Chicago Center for Teaching provide advising on teaching statements and teaching best practices. And we also now facilitate enrollment and admissions for future graduate programs. So I'm really excited to be here uh, today. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And it's actually going to be a, a little bit of a rehash of the first day of what we call Academic Job Market Summer Camp, which took place back in July. We had a five-day series of talks and conversations about multiple aspects of the academic job market. And you can actually find those presentations and uh, additionally today's content at grad.uchicago.edu or gradcareers.uchicago.edu. And I will definitely make myself available for questions. Um, I'll try to be as brisk as possible running through this, but I hope that you view this as the start of a conversation and you'll be in touch uh, with us to help navigate you through the academic job market search. So, for those of you uh, who are Odyssey fans as much as I am, you'll probably guess that the image on the title screen right now is uh, the uh, clear-eyed Odysseus navigating through Scylla and Charybdis. And when I uh, was first giving this talk, I thought about uh, the word navigation and tried to come up with some uh, kind of visual metaphors for how hard it is to navigate through the academic job market. And I started with this one because the academic job market uh, Navigating through it involves trying to find a way between too much advice on the internet, too much, too many voices, too much of a cacophony, and that's our skilla. And on the other side, there's no good advice whatsoever. You have no idea what to choose, and you might actually be operating um, with really few voices to help you get through this process. For those of you who are especially away from you, Chicago, at this point, you might be doing a lot of this stuff alone. And that, for us, are the, the twin perils um, of the academic job market. So I thought that was kind of a depressing metaphor. So I looked for other navigational metaphors, and I came up with the, the Titanic, unfortunately. Uh, and the Titanic is, is good because uh, some graduate students, postdocs, and alums basically have one source of advice, an advisor. And sometimes that one source of advice is really can be really challenging or really inappropriate given the realities of today's job market. You think you have this great advice. You're sailing through the night. It's a beautiful starless night. And then, boom, iceberg right ahead. So I didn't like that one either. I thought another one that could be apt would be Magellan. And I've talked to a lot of and advised a lot of students who have what I call would call the Magellan uh, outcome for the job market, which is you make it all the way around the world. You almost complete this incredible voyage. You're about to make it. You're at the campus interview, and you have a full day to show off your work. Wow, the students in the hiring committee. And then, boom, you get eaten by cannibals on the last leg of the journey. 
too often I think graduate students view this as a missed opportunity or just a real disaster. So I started, and I, I started to think, you know, maybe I agreed, maybe that naval metaphors weren't the best to use. So I started thinking about space, which is one of my favorite topics, as a lot of people here on campus know. And I, so I thought of the Apollo missions, and I think that, you know, one of the things that you need to think about as you're navigating through the academic job market is to embody the spirit of Apollo 13. Um, so I don't know if you can read the screen, but that's, of course, Jim Lovell, Ken Mattingly, and uh, uh, Ed Hayes. Um, so these guys, it was a kind of Pyrrhic victory, right? And I think it, when you're navigating through the market, you need to celebrate every small victory. Even if it feels like your ship blows up in the middle of a journey on the way to the moon, you need to celebrate the fact that you made it to an interview. You made it to a campus interview. These are difficult stages. And with tenure track applications uh, flooding the offices of hiring committees, often there are as many as 300 applicants for a single position, you need to make sure that you're taking time to be good to yourself and congratulate yourself for however far you get. But okay, what are some alternative space metaphors that might actually be helpful? Well, then I started thinking about Matthew McConaughey as an astronaut. And I think this is another way that people often think about academic job market searches is that the idea of getting a job in academia is equivalent to, spoiler alert, by the way, sorry if you guys haven't seen Interstellar, but saving the world, uh, getting back, uh, coming back in time, and seeing your family in time to basically say goodbye. It feels really heroic, right, when someone that you know of got a tenure track job at a great um, at a great university. But I think that perhaps the best metaphor, the best navigational metaphor to think about the academic job market, happened recently this summer. We talked about this at summer camp. It was the journey to Pluto. And if you'll indulge me uh, as I finish off this extended metaphor as a as a frame for today's conversation. For those of you who know uh, NASA, who don't know NASA, made it to Pluto this summer. It was a journey that took about 10 years. It was a journey whose purpose often seemed like it was fading into distant memory, seemed kind of obscure, and which got forgotten about in the general public. All the while, there were people silently working on getting a small spacecraft as far away as we've ever been to photograph a planet we've never seen before, or I guess pseudo-planet, sorry, Pluto. And to us at UChicago grad, the, dirt, the journey to Pluto is kind of the best navigational metaphor. It takes a long time to get somewhere. The victories can seem very small on the way, but ultimately it hopefully proves to be worth it no matter where you end up at the end of it. We say that it really does take a village to do this search successfully, and part of that is you recognizing that it's good to attend things like this today. Um, don't do what I did uh, one night in July and ask your phone, Siri, am I good enough to get an academic job? She'll answer kind of dispiritingly, um, but maybe in a tone that reminds you of your advisor, I'd rather not say. So what kind of village do you have around you? At UChicago grad, we hope that you won't do it alone. The Chicago Center for Teaching, uh, co-curricular programming that's available uh, to students and alumni and is also always available online. We, of course, have career development resources in our office, which you can sign up for. I'll talk about this at the end. That includes oral communication support where you can practice interviews and job talks, writing advising to go over your academic writing samples that are often required for these kinds of applications. So to the heart of the agenda today, I'm going to talk again in a lightning speed version of this much longer talk about what your CV does, some do's and don'ts to think about while you're crafting your CV, and I'll go into some specific common formatting and sections, and then I'll transition into academic cover letters, the second most common ingredient to an academic job market application portfolio. We'll talk a little bit about the genre and structure of the academic cover letter, which is a little bit different than cover letters that you might be used to writing for other kinds of jobs. And I'll focus on research, teaching, and service. These are the most common things that we hope that you'll be talking about in your academic cover letters. It's important also in these documents to communicate fit in some ways that I'll talk up, up through just a little bit about. And then I'll give you some next steps as you head into the application season this, this year, or perhaps are planning for something longer out. I'll open with a quote. Um, it's a CV can't change your experience, but it can help you make the most of, that exper of the experience that you've got. And that's Mike Tessel, who's a PhD in cancer bio and is on our staff at UChicago grad. We talk a lot about CVs in our office, and it's not the most exciting topic, so I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. But a CV really can help you articulate the best of your skills and experience and can be tailored to institutions in a way that I think a lot of people forget is possible along the way. 
So in order to understand how a CV can be helpful, I think it's important to understand what a CV can do and what a CV can't do almost no matter what. The first thing is a CV communicates the full impact of your accomplishments. It's a comprehensive document that, unlike a resume, doesn't really have a page limit, although we often say at UChicago grad that your CV shouldn't be as long as your advisors. Typically, when we advise students, CVs are around four to five pages for someone who's gone through a PhD program and is on the academic job market for the first time. This can be a little bit longer for those of you who might be postdocs or for any of you who might be applying for a, a full-time tenure-track job after something like a visiting assistant professorship or a postdoc. A CV can convince search, a search committee to read your other application materials very carefully. I think it's a mistake to think of the cover letter as something that a committee will definitely read first. It's likelier that many committee members might actually read your CV first, flip back to the cover letter, go to the research statement, make a cup of coffee, take a nap, I don't know, read a book, and come back. But a good CV will absolutely make the case that a committee member should spend as much time with the full content of your materials as, as, as possible. A good CV can help put you on the interview shortlist. What does that mean? That means that in a stack of 300 applicants, a strong CV that's written within the conventions of your discipline that makes a compelling case about your fitness and your experience to this point in your career can help you get not to the top of the pile, but into the pile that makes the cut for the first round of interviews. And I think that's how you need to be thinking about this. Your documents will not get you your job, I'll talk about that in a second, but they will give you the possibility of getting to that first round of interviews. Once you cut down from 30 to 50 candidates, you as a UChicago student or an alum have a much better chance of getting to that final round. And I think that a lot of people forget this. A, a CV will speak for you throughout the process of getting an academic job, which can also often take up to a couple of months. Don't think of your job documents as a one-time thing. It's not just that the hiring committee will read your documents once and then move on to uh, in-person interviews and, and forget it that you had a CV. Your CV will be present at every interview that you complete. It will follow you to your campus visit. It will be in front of lots of different stakeholders. CVs are sometimes put in front of student participants in mock classes on the day of your campus visit. So think about this as a document that isn't read once or only at one stage of the process, but that follows you throughout. And if your CV is good enough, it will hopefully evolve from your uh, academic job search through your job. Okay, so a good CV can't diverge far from the standard conventions of the genre. It's really important to understand what the conventions are within your particular subfield. And I should remind you that I'll give some basic best practices today, but you should absolutely be reading other CVs that are effective within your discipline to understand how people typically write these things. A CV can't distort or inflate your accomplishments. Faculty hiring committees have very little patience for CV padding, and there are a couple of common ways that people try to repeat themselves or make their awards sound a little inflated that I'll talk about in a little and you should avoid. No matter what, a CV can't compel the entire audience that will be interacting with your documents to read the whole thing. A CV is a long document, and therefore it's possible that with 300 applicants, a hiring committee just won't get to page five where they can read about your service and references. And that means that you need to make page one compelling. And finally, a good CV can't diminish the importance of your other application materials. Anybody who tells you that you need a pristine, perfect CV and that's the thing that's gonna make or break the case for you as, an, as a candidate for an academic job is forgetting that things like your academic work, your teaching statement, your research statement, your letters of recommendation, and your cover letter are all extremely important as well. Okay, as a, as a kind of general rule of thumb too though, keep in mind that your CV is not your advisor's CV and we think that's a good thing. So let me lay out some things and uh, some ways in which your CV is not the same as the CV that your advisor might send you as a model to write your own. So we'll talk about your advisor's CV and you. Your advisor's probably not looking for a job, uh, probably not at this stage in their career. And they may have been off the, the market for sometimes a very long time. Younger faculty advisors who've been on recently can give really great advice about this, but it's very possible that your advisor doesn't understand the realities of the job market now. Your advisors establish credibility in their field over a longer period of time, and that means that their accomplishments can kind of speak for themselves as, a, as an exhaustive list of publications, presentations, classes taught over a long career. And that, I'm sorry, so that's 
that means that they can rely on what we typically think of as a traditional CV, which is just a list of accomplishments that speak for themselves. Whereas you are looking for a job now in today's academic job market in a crowded field of overqualified candidates, and you're still developing yourself as a respected name in your field. What this means is that you should elaborate on specifics of your research and teaching experience and contextualize the unique value that you have to offer at a particular academic institution. People might not understand the specific language that's specific to U Chicago. They might not understand what a preceptor is, what a lector is, what a course assistant does. And while you're still early in your career, you should be expanding on some of the activities that you completed as a graduate student or a postdoc and make sure that committees understand exactly what it is that you've done while you're here on campus and after. We'll go into specific sections in just a moment. With all of that in mind, I'll go into some what we call unbreakable rules for your CV. I can't say this enough, right? Anybody who tells you that there are hard and fast rules to CVs is probably trying to sell you a guidebook on how to write CVs uh, that they say is the, the best advice in the world. All rules of CVs are breakable, bendable, and it's important to understand what the rules are so that you can figure out where the bendable places are. We'll give you a, I'll give you a, a sense of the top 10 CV do's. First and foremost is read other CVs in your discipline to understand the conventions for your specific subfield or field. Abstracts are more acceptable in some fields than they are in others. Research sections are more acceptable in some fields than they are in others. It's important that you read some other successful CVs from recent job candidates if you can get your hands on them to understand what they look like. You absolutely do need to tailor your CV at least a little bit to institutions. Your CV for a research one job that's tenure track should not look the same necessarily as a job that's something like a visiting assistant professorship at a liberal arts institution. We've spoken to many people about this and it, it does appear to us, at least in terms of the, the folks that we've talked to at other institutions, that teaching should be the emphasis when you're applying to jobs that really require teaching. And that means that you need to read job descriptions and understand what the institution is placing a priority on. Um, that will help you understand how to make page one compelling enough for the reader to continue. One of the ways to really do that is to understand exactly what a job description is asking for and to make sure that you're talking about your experience in teaching or research in a way that's appropriate given the job description. It should explain the significance of your work, that is it should go into some detail about the things that you've accomplished while here at UChicago and after. And it should vary section styles to suit the content and move the reader along. There's nothing I hate more than seeing a CV with dates just lined up on the left-hand side. It seems very dry. It's very hard to delineate different sections. Dates might not be the most important piece of information in a given section. And it's important that you vary the content and feel flexible enough to vary the content so that it can convey the, the information in each section most efficiently. You should focus on innovation and impact. What are your publications? What are the outcomes of your research? Um, how much grant money did you raise? So you should be thinking about how your research contributes to an overall intellectual trajectory. And in the same time, you should be specific regarding the methodologies employed as you pursue innovation and impact. Uh, this is this is more common, especially in the sciences. You should talk specifically about how your research experience leverages specific methodologies or helps you develop skills that will be valued in labs uh, in the institution that you're applying to. We do argue here that you should quantify wherever possible. You should talk about the numbers of students in classes, the frequency that class met. You should talk about the number of times that you were a course assistant for a particular class. It's important to give hiring committees a very specific idea of how your experience evolved over the course of your career. And you should think a little bit more about font and layout. Don't just default to Calibri because that's the font that shows up when Microsoft Word opens up. You want to be the candidate who is visibly distinct enough. Uh, we suggest using something like Garamond uh, or a really nice sans font like uh, Gotham, which is actually what you're looking at on the screen here. You don't want to be Times New Roman, which uh, I've heard often called the sweatpants of fonts. Um, but you don't want to, to uh, a wheel and deal or, or move all the way over to wingdings, right? So pick a, a readable font that's a little bit outside the standard uh, that shows up whenever you open your word processor. And the last and I think maybe one of the most important is you have to proofread these things. And you have to get other eyes on these documents to proofread these things. Some people are embarrassed to share their CVs. I think that's a real mistake. You should be definitely getting advice from other people and having them dig into commas 
colons, making sure bolding is bolding conventions are used consistently throughout. I once saw a CV with two E's in education, and the student had been bleary-eyed staring at this thing all night and had actually missed two E's in the first line of their CV. Totally happens, and it's important that you have a good community of proofreaders around you. Okay, so let's talk about top ten CV don'ts, things that we don't think Indiana Jones should do or something. I just like this picture. I love 80s movies. These presentations are so boring if you if you don't at least throw in some images once in a while. So I hope, and I'm also used to having laughter, or at least the suggestion of laughter, so it's very bizarre to be staring at this camera. Hopefully you're laughing just a little bit. Um, top 10 things that we hope you won't do in your CV. You shouldn't expect everyone to read the whole thing. These are long documents, and this speaks to why we think that you should be making page one compelling enough for people to turn to the second page. Neither should you assume that a publication list replaces the need to include details about your research and teaching especially. People stress out so much about the number of citations that they have in their publication section, but undergraduate institutions or positions that call for undergraduate teaching and the support of undergraduate research need evidence that you actually know how to teach undergraduates, and it's important to balance the information based on the job description. Almost always you should not include a half-page summary of your dissertation or research. We see a lot of first drafts of, uh, of uh, CVs that have long summaries of dissertations and this document is not the place um, to have that kind of information. This is a small one. We see it often because it's an older convention. You don't need to write curriculum vitae anywhere on the document. You could potentially put it in the lower left-hand corner, lower right-hand corner of the document where your page numbers are, but you don't need to create a header that says CV on it. It's very obvious to the people who are reading this document that it is your CV and not like your math homework. Um, don't list course numbers. Uh, they're almost never useful. They don't translate across institutions. Stick to only course titles. We include this because we see it a fair bit. Um, and you shouldn't tack on employment that's not related to research or academics. Um, we don't need to know about your job at Ben & Jerry's when you're in college. We see a lot of uh, not applicable employment. But that is, that's not to say that you shouldn't include research assistant positions or jobs in libraries that, where you might have developed skills that might be valued in an academic position. Don't use subjective claims. This isn't too much of a problem, except when it does appear, it's a big problem. Don't call your publications or your research exceptional or grand, groundbreaking, etc. You want to let the committee decide how your work fits into the context of their departments. And this is one that we see a lot with international students. No photos, birth dates, any personal or biographical information. We know it's a convention in some uh, other countries to include marital status. It's definitely not something that is appropriate for a CV in this context. I said this already, but just to drive it home, it shouldn't be longer than your advisor's CV. It's a good rule of thumb. Uh, there's no real page limit to these things, but shorter than your advisor's is a, is a, good, is a good rule. And the last thing is don't undersell yourself. Um, I'll, sh I'll talk about this in some specific sections, but you should be talking a little bit in more detail about your specific accomplishments and achievements, and not just let the fact that you were a course assistant once sit in one tiny line in your teaching sec section. Broaden that out a little bit more and help the hiring committee understand why that was actually a really tough position to hold. Um, when it comes to basic formatting, like I said, CV, uh, saying curriculum vitae is not required. The most common categories that we see are education, research, teaching, publications, awards and honors, and service. There are lots of variations within those, but we think if you're starting from scratch, those are the sections that you should be focusing on work within reverse chronological order within each section, and be consistent when you're formatting the sections, dates, bold and italicized, how you list locations, um, and punctuation. It's important that you just adopt a convention and stick to it throughout. Like I've said, include descriptions of each experience, and I'll talk about bullets versus paragraphs uh, in just a second. Don't, uh, don't make your uh, margins any less than 0.7 inches if you can help it. Respect the eyes of the reader and understand that they're going to be reading a lot of these things. So it's important that you keep the margins to something standard. That goes for fonts too. 11 is the absolute smallest that you should be going on a CV, especially because you have a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to the, the length. And always, always, always save and submit your document in a PDF form whether you're uploading to Interfolio, sending via email anyway. Um, this might be second nature to all, a lot of you, but just to hold hands around it and say we're going to submit in PDF, make sure that there's no formatting wonkiness when you convert from something like pages especially into PDF can be problematic. All right, let's go into detail in some of these sections and talk about, uh, talk with some specificity about how this actually looks on the page. 
So the contact information at the top should take up as little space as possible, two to two, one to two lines maximum. Um, it should include your address, uh, your snail mail address, your phone number, and your email address. That means that your address doesn't have to appear anywhere else, and that means on the cover letter too, so you can save space on the cover letter. If you do have a good web presence, it's more and more acceptable to put your personal website at the top of a CV, not a LinkedIn site for sure, but if you have a good home for your research online, you can certainly include in your contact information. When it comes to education, I personally like to see the education section arranged by degrees. I have some colleagues in the department who prefer uh, the year, especially if you've moved quickly through your program, it can be uh, helpful to show that. Uh, if you haven't finished yet, it can be helpful to say that your PhD is expected in 2015 and not necessarily highlight by putting the date on the left-hand side that you're not finished yet. We've seen that being completed, being done with your dissertation, being done with your PhD is one really strong indicator of success on the academic job market. Which is not to say that you can't apply ABD. We've seen candidates finish without dissertation and done and PhD in hand, but it is, there's a strong correlation between being finished and having higher rates of success on the market. I like to sneak in a couple of really fancy brand name awards, if possible, into the top of, edu of the education section. I don't like seeing award sections following the education section right away. It's a little braggy. It's more about your accomplishments than it is about your experience. I like to see awards further down after teaching and publications, if possible. But if you do have a good name brand award, it can be helpful to highlight that right in the top section. What comes next after your education really depends on the type of institution and position. Is it a teaching institution? Are you going to be required to do more research and publications at this institution than R1? Um, you can include your oral examinations in the education section or separately if you think that your oral exam areas will be applicable to the job description and your fitness to the position, um, where your publications go. This will all depend on each specific position. So I'll talk a little bit more about those. So looking, pulling out from just page one now, we've got a student who's student, student, and whose name and contact information are two, just two lines. I love it, nice and efficient. Um, their education section is a little bit longer. Um, and as I said, you, it can include your dissertation title and your, dissert, and your dissertation committee. That can be helpful. You see this student included their examination fields as well right at the top. It's a very efficient way to summarize how your expertise was generated uh, while in graduate school. Um, we do often see some postdocs and people who are applying from uh, after their first position include something like current position or current research role before the education section just to indicate that you've been employed uh, since your PhD. Um, I'll talk about publications in a little bit more in a second. Uh, here I like this page one because the student does have two publications but that relatively small list is complemented by works that are in progress and or under review. And notice how efficient it is. They still manage to get the first couple of lines of teaching experience on the first page. So you don't even have to worry about um, where teaching goes as long as it's on that first page. If your publications are a little thin and you're worried about that, it's okay. You can actually use that to your advantage and get more really useful information on page one. Again, I'd go with teaching as opposed to awards and honors. I want to briefly talk about um, the bullet points or paragraphs in each of these sections. Um, so first and foremost, this is really common in the sciences and social sciences, a little less so in the humanities and, um, and divinity school here on campus. Research experience sections can be great places to really focus on innovation. I like this research section because it's not traditional bullet points, but if you notice how these paragraphs are written, they really are sentence fragments that read, if you read them in a row, like individual bullet points. So talking about what you developed and designed in the lab is a focus on innovation. Um, and you can talk about the impact of that innovation as well. Notice the student talked about the specific methodologies employed. This is especially helpful when a job description says we, they want researchers with specific kinds of methodology training in their arsenal. Collaboration can be really important, especially in a lab setting, but across a lot of different kinds of departments as well. Uh, it shows that you're a good department citizen and someone who can work across relationships. And remember that mentoring can be really good, as, especially if your teaching is a little thin. If you've mentored undergraduate researchers in a lab setting or in the library or managed small teams of undergrads throughout your experience, that can be really strong. And the last thing is, of course, grant writing. Faculty committees love seeing successful grant writers because they know that they'll be able to come into the institution and bring money along with them. 
Think about your, take a pause here before I talk about teaching and think about hiring committee skepticism about U Chicago as you move through this process. Hiring committees, we often hear, are skeptical about your teaching experience. They might think that you don't teach at all and that when you do teach, it's only within your subfield and only in seminars with just U Chicago students. You need to allay that skepticism because this produces the feeling that you won't understand the specific needs of their institution. Any teaching that you've done outside U Chicago can help. Any descriptions of how preceptoring is more like mentoring or how mentoring people in the lab is really like a pedagogical experience can be really helpful in showing a committee that you're not what they think is a typical U Chicago student and that you have experience interacting with undergrads across a lot of different uh, contexts. How does this bear out in an actual teaching section? Um, for sciences where you might not have a ton of teaching, mentoring and tutoring really can count here and you can include it in your teaching experience. Um, be specific and include quantification to really clarify how you interact with students. And I think that one experience that's always valued across hiring committees is to specify that you were involved in course or syllabus development. This is really key, especially as they want to have scholars in-house who are going to use their research to produce great classes for undergrads. And don't underestimate the importance of teaching for research jobs. We all know how expensive college is nationwide, uh, from top to bottom when it comes to the top 500 institutions. And everybody at those colleges and universities needs people who can really come in and be really great teachers um, to keep attracting undergraduates. This bears out a little bit differently for the humanities and social sciences. I will just briefly go through this. It's, it's roughly the same. Um, notice here the, the student uses bullets instead of paragraphs, but continues to use quantification. And hopefully here you get a sense of how we like to think about building out your teaching experience from just the simple list. A last element here is that pedagogy training, if you're very thin on actual classroom experience, can be really helpful to show. It shows that you care about teaching and that you took advantage of opportunities to develop as an instructor even though you weren't actually in front of a class. I really like to see people who add um, either their Little Red Schoolhouse training or their Chicago Center for Teaching teaching certificate um, in, in a teaching section. It can be really helpful. Publications, fairly straightforward. Um, you should choose the citation convention of a well-respected journal in your field and use it throughout. It's the best way to decide how you should be listing publications here. Um, and you can include manuscripts that are at varying stages of publication, in press, unpublished, in review, and in preparation. We typically like to talk to students about how to leverage these different subheadings in order to be both honest uh, and to make sure that you're talking about research that has a trajectory such that a paper that you have in prep right now might be under review by the time you get an interview. That's really why you include it. Abstracts and posters should be included in a separate section and presentations should often uh, should most often be included in a separate section as well. We know that sometimes conference abstracts are, are published separately but it's really important to have conference presentations, uh, workshop presentations somewhere else. Briefly on service, this is often the most confusing section, but committee work, representing organizations, and your ability to, to speak to specific accomplishments within a department um, or a committee context is really important. Remember that hiring managers, hiring committees, want people who can come in and act as faculty. You'll have duties that you will have to do on day one on admissions committee or on course design committee, and it's important that you can demonstrate that you have some experiences in these areas. Okay, I'm going to pivot now to the academic uh, cover letter and just make some brief comments here um, and then we'll, we'll throw it over to Q&A. Um, I think the academic job market cover letter is stressful for people mostly because it feels like a totally alien exercise. It feels like you've got to be Luke Skywalker learning how to use the force, right? In this case, I'm Yoda on your back if you want to think about it that way. But really, the academic job market cover letter is just another piece of writing. It's just another genre that has rules and conventions that need to be mastered. And I think that graduate students should be taking pressure off themselves when they think about how to craft these documents. There's nothing worse than staring at a blinking cursor not knowing where to start. So what does it take to master this kind of alien genre, this, uh, this two-page document that seems to hold your fate in its hands? Again, we want to talk about what a cover letter can actually do and what it can't do no matter what. A cover letter like the CV gives you the chance to do the easy stuff. Formatting these things correctly is harder than you might think. Spell check is really important and you're going to go through a lot of drafts which means that errors are constant. 
The second that you spell a hiring committee member's name wrong or uh, miss a comma or you know capitalize things that shouldn't be capitalized, it's really hard for hiring committees to justify continuing to engage with your materials if they see that kind of laziness with the easy stuff. More than anything else, a cover letter gives narrative shape to your CV. So if you think of the CV as the bones of your experience, this, the cover letter is the chance to give some muscle, some sinew, some tissue that surrounds those bones and helps put it together. It's another way of saying that you shouldn't be listing your accomplishments in your cover letter. That's what the CV is for. You should be picking specific experiences and stories that help to bring the experiences in your CV to life. Demonstrating your fit to an institution is one of the most overlooked uh, responsibilities of a cover letter. You should be talking in very specific terms wherever possible why you are a really good fit for an institution. We hope that you'll avoid the word fit, we call it the F word at UChicago grad, but you should be trying to tell the hiring committee exactly why you might be a good department citizen, why it makes sense to hire you within the context of a bunch of people who will surround you as faculty. It's another way of saying that you should have shown that you've done your homework, that you understand a little bit about the institution's mission, the classes they teach, the students that they have in those classes, and that will help you get an interview. Um, I think an important final piece here, and this is a, a bit that we've, we've uh, kind of taken from Karen Kelsky, who writes a blog called The Professor Is In. These documents help present to you as a future colleague, not as a graduate student, not as a job applicant, but as someone that faculty can actually imagine having on staff with them. That means that you need to project confidence in some subtle ways that I'll talk about. But you shouldn't be referring your, to your, higher, your uh, dissertation committee as doctor. You shouldn't be saying things like, it would be an honor to join your faculty. You should be confident that you deserve a place in the faculty and write your cover letter as such. Again, a cover letter cannot get you a job. I've never heard of a faculty hiring committee who said, well, their interview was terrible, but their cover letter was just, it just blew us away, so we decided to hire them anyway. Um, a cover letter is just one piece of the puzzle, so you shouldn't be agonizing over absolutely every detail of these things. A cover letter won't stand in for general interest in a particular position. If you're finding it hard to describe real reasons why you want a job at Institution X, let's say it's a small college in the middle of a very snowy part of the country and you just can't figure out why you might want to be there, it's a good sign that you might want to spend less time applying to that institution or not apply to that institution and instead dedicate your energy to the places where you might actually imagine yourself. And finally, I think this is really important, it shouldn't tell the entire story of your dissertation's evolution from the shadow of an idea to the core focus of your academic life. Two paragraphs on your dissertation are sufficient, and it's really important that you not spend too much time focusing on this one part of your application. Last thing, you shouldn't be going on to a third page. Potentially, if you are currently in a postdoc position as an alum uh, or have moved on to a visiting assistant professorship and are, are moving on to a, a tenure track position, two pages maximum single spaced. This I'm not going to go into too much. I want to just highlight that if you still are a student and you're on this webinar today, if you are a student, you should be using the letterhead from the department that you're currently enrolled in. If you're currently teaching at another institution, you should be using that letterhead. It's an important marker of your affiliation. This is different from cover letters for non-academic jobs, but it's important that you have this uh, marker of affiliation as part of your, uh, your overall documents. I'll say one thing about the bottom, the end. You should be confident and short in your conclusion. I'm excited about the prospect of working in the Department of Weights and Measures, and I look forward to speaking more soon. It's not an honor. It wouldn't be a privilege, although, yeah, it really would be a privilege to join the faculty. But you want to suggest that you're confident enough to look forward to the next conversation. Last thing here, sign the letter. Scan a signature and put it in there. It's a very subtle way to humanize what is otherwise a very dehumanizing kind of process, just you in black and white. Okay, how do you give narrative shape to your CV? Um, oops, once the Death Star exploding, sorry. Um, the narrative works something like this. Like a CV, your cover letter will work in sections. Typically, we see an introduction that is very brief, that basically says who you are, what your credentials are, and where your research expertise lies. You shouldn't be saying anything too specific or too prosy in the introduction. It's really just a way to establish yourself as a qualified candidate, that you have what they need for the position. Moving into the dissertation overview from there, your first paragraph, especially at Research One, 
institutions should be talking about the project itself. What is the argument of the project? How does it evolve? And you should be writing about it in terms that are legible to people who are outside your subfield. Remember that at many institutions, there will not be an expert on your hiring committee. There might not be somebody who understands the specific terms of your very particular project. It can be really useful to talk about your dissertation such that someone adjacent to your subfield or perhaps in another department might be able to understand. It's important too to talk about how your dissertation makes a contribution to the critical conversation as currently constituted in your field. So you need to understand how your dissertation or whatever project you're working on currently uh, moves forward the conversation amongst peers in other places in the field. Moving from there, most typically we see a transition into teaching, and it's important that you talk about specific teaching experiences and then service to the department. Throughout, we really think that the best cover letters have the ability to articulate why you are a good fit for an institution, but at the very, very least, there should be a paragraph that talks about specific ways in which you would be a good citizen within the department to which you're applying. It can be tricky to name faculty, specific faculty, and you should talk to your dissertation advisor or committee about whether it's a good idea to name particular people, but certainly enumerating certain ways that you would leverage centers on campus, study abroad opportunities, opportunities to mentor undergraduates, or teach within a core where you have specific expertise can be very good. And then a formal sign off. I'm going to just, I'm not going to talk about all of these just in the interest of moving quickly towards uh, the end of our conversation. I do want to talk about uh, two specific things. The first, we see this all the time. We see sentences that say, although I am not the perfect candidate for this position because I'm outside the subfield, or because, I, or even though I don't have exactly what you're looking for, try to scrub your cover letter of these kinds of uh, phrases. It's important that you do articulate what you do have in terms that they're asking for. So even if you don't feel like you're a perfect fit for the position, you should try to articulate the value of your research and teaching experience in terms that are echoed in the job description. The second thing I would, uh, I would really emphasize here is to not be a diva. Uh, you're not going, this is number 10 on our list and I'll leave you to read the rest. Um, my paper on whatever thing rocked the world, the field. And the chances are that it kind of didn't. Uh, and faculty hiring committees don't want to hire a diva. They want to hire someone who's a colleague, someone who will come in and contribute, not someone who will come in and blow up the entire department. That is, they, want, they don't want Russell Crowe, noted famous diva who comes on sets and just breaks things. They want, to be, they want you to be Hugh Jackman. Cool, calm, collected, always looking good. Um, we print these posters up, we hand them out all the time. If you want a Do Be Hugh Jackman uh, poster, we can certainly include that in a PDF for the materials. I hang it over my computer uh, all the time uh, just when I feel bummed about things, so it helps. After that, I do want to emphasize a couple of these things here um, about cover letter dues. You should expect everyone to read this whole document. Um, that's kind of first and foremost. Everyone will make it through your entire cover letter almost assuredly, especially when you get to the interview stage. And I would say here, number four uh, and number eight are very, very important as well. You should be demonstrating how you're going to take the next few steps in your career, whether that's your research or your teaching. How does your research help them understand courses that you might teach that grow out of that, um, the research expertise that you have currently? I'll answer questions about these as well if you have them. We talked about how to talk about your dissertation already. I think the most important things here are really to make sure that someone outside of your subfield reads your cover letter. They should be able to understand precisely what your dissertation is about and talk to you about it. Right? This is setting, up, setting you up for success in an interview. If a faculty hiring committee really doesn't get the stakes or the so what of your of your dissertation, then they're not going to want to have you in for an interesting conversation about how that research is going. It's helpful to take a look at who's on the hiring committee too. This can really help you understand how specific you, you can be when you're talking about your research project in your cover letter. On teaching, the, really, the, the most important thing to emphasize here is that you shouldn't just be listing the courses that you're prepared to teach and have taught. Rather, you should show through specific examples, specific interactions with students, specific assignments that you've designed. You should make sure that the hiring committee understands that you're committed to teaching, but remember that you likely have a teaching portfolio or teaching statement that you're submitting. 
cover letter is a place to give one thesis statement about the kind of instructor you are, and then highlight one or two experiences that really drive home how that hits the road in your classrooms. Um, do consider the institutional demands, courses that are required, courses that you might be able to teach. It can be helpful to say that you have expertise broadly so that you can teach introductory classes. We very often see that this is a requirement in job descriptions that individuals be ready to teach a methods course or an introduction to lab practices or the survey course for a particular field. It's very important that you address this in the cover letter and show that you're ready, willing, and really able to do this. The last thing is communicating fit. These are some ways that you can actually talk about your affiliation or your fitness to an institution. If you've met faculty that are on the hiring committee, if you've met faculty in the department, it can be really productive to mention previous co collaborations or conversations. Say that you've already met these people, you've already worked with them, you've been familiar with their work. The last thing you want to do is just name drop and say, I would be a, co a great colleague for Professor X or Professor Y or Professor Z. You need to express real familiarity with the work of the department and, if appropriate, specific faculty. In some cases, you can name required classes that you will have to teach. There's a little bit of a pitfall here. Some faculty might always teach the required course on X thing, and you don't want to, if it looks like um, from your research on the website that someone always teaches a class, you don't want to be seen as horning in on their uh, annual teaching. What you want to say is, name some of the classes that you could potentially teach, and then talk about how you might be able to teach them. You can be as specific here as using specific works or texts. Last question we get uh, a lot is, if I'm from the Midwest, should I talk about why I want to teach in the Midwest? And we think absolutely. If you went to a small liberal arts college and you're applying to a small liberal arts college, you should talk about how you have an affiliation or an affinity to a liberal arts college. If you are from North Dakota, uh, faculty want to make sure that you that they're not going to lose faculty at North Dakota want to make sure that they're not going to lose faculty they want to keep people here they're investing in people they want people to be able to grow with the institution so that means if you love North Dakota you should say how much you love North Dakota at least in a sentence and make sure that they understand that you're not going to be bolting for the coasts at the first opportunity in terms of next steps I hope that you would write a cover letter in sections. Don't worry about the length and be prepared to cut. Share your letter with someone outside your field, and certainly with us at UChicago Grad. Um, you can compose a few paragraphs about your, uh, for yourself about why you got into graduate school, how your dissertation evolved over the course of time. And I say lock that thing up in a drawer. And win, lose, or draw at the end of the academic job market this year, take it out. Remind yourself why you got into this business in the first place, this crazy thing, why you set out for Pluto, um, or whatever. Whatever metaphor works for you. It can be really helpful at the end of this process to be reminded how you feel right now about graduate school and orient yourself towards feeling positive. Start reading job descriptions for sure and researching institutions that you might apply to, um, and that can be really helpful, especially as we head into the heart of when these things start getting posted. Throughout it, I think it's important for you to be honest with yourself about your priorities. Um, we talk about this a lot at UChicago Grad. Um, we hear from candidates all the time that they're applying to 50 and 60 jobs, and it's just crazy. Um, you should be honest about what you want out of the next step that you're going to take, and be sure that you have your priorities in check. Um, we think it's much more effective to apply to institutions where you think you'll be a good fit and where you think you'll be happy. And so it's important for you to have some of these priorities, these preferences, these real commitments that you have to family or to geography or to not separating yourself from a spouse or a partner. And think about how those might affect your happiness at an institution to which you apply. It's important stuff and I don't think we talk about it enough, um, but we certainly do at UChicago Grad, so we invite you to that conversation. Um, I hope there are questions. I still see people here, so we didn't lose everybody, um, but hopefully you can interrogate me now. Um, so I guess I'll hand it back over to Dan. That's right. I have the Darth Vader role here, so I get to come in and interrogate you with questions, not you presenting. <laughs> so thanks, AJ. Uh, we have a couple from the audience that we'd love to field here. Uh, we have a really astute observer who noticed in one of your CV examples that you had two lines in the address there. And um, particularly, she noted that you used personal mailing addresses, not departmental addresses, and she mm -hmm. has heard that you should use both. Are you advocating using just your personal email address, and could you talk about that? For a I don't. Second? You know, I think um, I think that's an important question. I, I'm used to seeing first drafts of CVs that have five or six line addresses, and you're just killing yourself on that first page if you're wasting so many lines 
telling us where you're from. Uh, I, I just think that it's important to be as efficient as possible. I see some CVs with departmental address and personal address oriented side by side. Again, I think that's it's it's redundant. It's a little bit unnecessary. I do know that some people feel strongly that they should be putting their departmental address because of privacy concerns. I think that's totally acceptable. I don't have a personal preference as to whether you put your personal or your departmental address. Um, I would just advocate that you take up less space rather than more when it comes to putting that stuff on paper. Hope that helps. Thanks, that's great. Uh, another question, you had mentioned about using letterhead uh, for your cover letter, and the question was if someone only has a loose affiliation with an institution, should they use the letterhead of their institution in their cover letter, or in a different way, is it damaging not to have the institutional letterhead? I don't, I, it would be more damaging to use letterhead in an inappropriate context than it would be to not have it at all. I mean, keep in mind, you know, affiliation can be marked in, in many different ways, and you're going to be starting your cover letter by saying that you have a doctorate from the University of Chicago or soon will have, and that's really the most important thing. What I would say is, be honest with yourself and with the people that you're working for. And you can go to an administrator, go to a fellow faculty member if it's a teaching affiliation, if you're currently a research fellow or just kind of affiliate faculty, talk to people. You can ask them questions about this. They will definitely tell you. Um, and it's important to get a couple of opinions and approach it from saying, you know, I'm just curious, and you can even blame me. Uh, you know, I listened to a webinar that suggested that I should be using departmental letterhead. Given my position, is that something that you think would be important? Um, again, I would say being honest with yourself about whether you have earned that right. Um, it's, it's much more straightforward if you're a graduate student in a department. You have that right here, and the faculty should want to give you that letterhead so that you um, are as effective on the job market as possible. But it's much better to just go out there with uh, you know, just your name uh, on, a, on a, a cover letter than to claim a departmental affiliation that you don't have. Great. Uh, one more question just came in, and uh, this might be one that you follow up on, but her question is, if my publication lists too long in the CV, uh, it's both English and Chinese essays, should I shorten to keep it uh, the CV under six pages? It's almost eight pages now. No, no, I mean, I think I, 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 I've heard differing opinions on whether or not you should break out international publications. I think that that can be good if you have enough. I mean, you have a great problem, right? Uh, we are often talking with students about um, a very manageable problem of having too few publications and how do you talk about your work in a way that demonstrates your real productivity without overemphasizing the fact that you've only actually gotten one thing out in the world or something like that. I think your problem is a little bit different. I wouldn't say that a long publication list is a problem. I think you can be a little bit creative about how you break that out. Um, you know, there are some tenure streams where publications written in other languages would be viewed uh, as less important than publications produced in English. You, I'm, I'm assuming that you know that within your field, you could break out publications in English, publications in Chinese. You can break out your publications by peer-reviewed uh, in one subhead, book reviews in another, conference abstracts in another. So there are lots of ways that you can get creative. Um, I would make sure that your publications list doesn't, uh, doesn't completely uh, efface your teaching experience. For those of you who have long publications lists, period, remember that teaching is often important at liberal arts schools, and if a teaching section takes three lines, uh, it can go on the first page, and publications can be right under that, whereas if you have a page and a half of publications, you're getting people all the way to the third page before they see teaching. For Research One institutions, it's less of an issue because they do really want to see publications first. I do have, an, I have a competing perspective on this, which is Mike Tessels, um, he's very good at articulating this. Publication section is the one thing a hiring committee will not forget to look for. So in some ways, no matter where you put it, they're going to be looking for it in the document. That's the one thing that everybody does really want to know about. So take the pressure off yourself a little bit. Um, they'll find it wherever it is in the document. Great. Uh, I just got a couple questions to round that as we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, one thing, so you betrayed yourself at the very beginning with your cryptus analogy, but I'd like to know, so if I, if I can't come to Dagobah and I can't find you in the swamp, are there any good <laughs> internet resources that you actually would recommend me look out there? Oh man, I love having a Star Wars nerd out there somewhere <laughs> as I stare at this interrogation droid and just like love how clever I am that I use this. Um, 
No Dagobah, no Tatooine. Um, well, the best place to go, and we'll follow up with resources as well, is gradcareers.uchicago.edu. By next week, we'll have our 2015-2016 academic CV guide up for all of you all. Unlike uh, other institutions, all of our materials are in front of a firewall. We don't want to prevent access from anything. So we have guides, we'll have guides on CVs, on academic cover letters. There will be shorter versions of this presentation that are available in handout form. You can also get similar handouts on interviews. And if you're an alum, specifically five years out from the program or a current graduate student, you can actually log in to currently Advise Stream. It'll soon be a different platform to set up 60-minute conversations with our advisors at UChicago Grad. We do these things via Skype. I mean, just look at my cool headset. You think we're not used to this? Um, we do them by Skype. We do them by phone all the time. Uh, we really want to emphasize to the 28 of you who are still out there in the ether somewhere, we're here for you guys and we want to be supportive as you go through this process. So gradcareers.uchicago.edu, you can email me directly, I'm just aj at uchicago if you have any trouble finding anything, uh, and grad.uchicago.edu is the homepage for the entire umbrella of UChicago Grad. Great, and thanks for all those resources. So I got one last question here because I know I get asked it all the time and I'd be remiss if I didn't get it in if it didn't come up. And you mentioned not including LinkedIn on your CV, but what is the likelihood that members of your search committee will actually look at your LinkedIn profile? Mm -hmm. Rhetorical question, should I have one? And so if so, what's the one thing out there I should make sure is on it? That's a, I mean, that's a great question. It's, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear this from the perspective of like you have it and you're on the academic job market and you're excited about that. We're always telling graduate students that it's not a problem to have a LinkedIn profile as an academic. There's actually a great study out of Babson College um, that has been uh, studying faculty use of social media over the course of the last 10 years are the only ones that I know that have done this kind of survey and faculty use of LinkedIn has skyrocketed over the past eight years. It is very likely that uh, younger faculty will take a look at your LinkedIn profile if you have it. Um, it's, LinkedIn is great about maximizing Google search so that if you have your LinkedIn profile settings set up such that you are Googleable, that will literally show up. Academia.edu is pretty good to have as well. I would say the most important thing to have in a LinkedIn profile if you're using LinkedIn for an academic search is to make sure you have a good public picture that shows you um, chest and above or shoulders and above. Um, you can get these actually done uh, you know, at events when you see a photographer for free. You can do them uh, headshots. I had a friend who had really nice headshots taken at Target uh, for relatively cheaply. Um, a really good picture is important. It humanizes you a little bit. I think the other thing to be wary of is that faculty who are uninformed about how often academics use LinkedIn might see your LinkedIn profile as an indication that you're interested in non-academic jobs.